Hey, I'm Thomas. And I'm Reuben. And if you didn't know me already, I'm the online campus pastor at Hope City Church. Now, before we jump into the service, there are actually three things we want you to do today. Yeah, if you're new to us, go to hopecity.ca slash new and let us know you were engaging with us today. We want to help you get connected. Secondly, if you're looking for a way to be involved, please don't wait any longer. There are options from online hosting to video production and so much in between. Go to hopecity.ca slash serve for information and to actually get started. If you happen to have teens in your home, there are some incredible options for them to engage with us at Hope City Youth. I'm actually one of the youth pastors here at Hope City Church. We believe in offering your teenagers an incredible experience and connection every week with God and other people. You can participate with us every Tuesday night in person from 7 to 8 p.m. for our youth church service. We also have the option for you to tune in online via our live stream. And every Friday night, we also have small group nights online. It's such a great time to connect with other teenagers and incredible leaders. And on occasional Thursdays, we have video game hangouts online throughout the whole youth community. Now, if you want to get your teenager involved, please feel free to reach out to me or visit hopec.ca slash youth to check out all the details. Now, my oldest is actually in middle school and loves what Pastor Ruben, Pastor Josh, and the entire team offer week after week. See, even if you don't have a teen in your home, though, there's something here for you, too. Go to hopecity.ca slash church dash online and find out how you can get connected with us, with each other, and especially with Jesus. So wherever you're watching from, we're so glad you're engaging with us. Enjoy the service. Well, welcome to church. Join us as we sing.
a situation. He brings hope and freedom. Hey, I'm Bernie. This is uh, Wendy singing with us and we and the musicians uh, along all of us here. We're just so happy to be a part of this moment with you and uh, to be worshiping together with you on this very cold day. Um, you know, we're all in different places. We're scattered in homes all over, but we're not alone. And God is doing something in each one of our lives as we direct our attention and our worship to him today. Why don't you just take a moment right now and invite his presence into that space you're in right now. You know, I just love this next song. It talks about the hope we have in Jesus and that uh, he lives his life in us. You know, the truth is sometimes um, there can be parts of us in the depths of our being that feel kind of dead. Sometimes that's because there's toxic things that work in our lives that are trying to undo us and like literally bring about spiritual death. But Jesus took on death and he won. And when we come into relationship with him and when we experience the never ending life that he gives us, we're also set free from the fear, uh, the grip of fear that, that spiritual and physical death has on us. So hey, today, if you're really feeling like you're going through a hard time, I just wanna encourage you, don't give up. Don't lose hope. Uh, don't cave into fear. The song says, when I'm afraid, I will lift you up. Use praise as a weapon to fight back against fear. I'm fighting back with the song of praise. I'm fighting back, lifting up your name. My quiet voice can make mountains shake. Jesus, turn my fear to faith. And when there's death, Jesus, you are life. When I'm alone, you are by my side. I'll look to you in the darkest night. You have shown me how to fight. I'm afraid I will lift you up. Jesus, my hope, you're the one I love. I'll shout your name and I'll never stop. Let my praise be loud on this battleground, Jesus. Now is the time. Your kingdom come. Your holy church sings in unison. And this praise is our weapon. When I'm afraid, I will lift you up. Jesus, my hope, you're the one I love. How shall your name?
fear in our lives. that we have in you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to show us your heart, to show us what you're like. Thank you, Jesus, that you came and you literally gave your life as the penalty for our sins. God, you created us because you wanted to be in relationship with us. We thank you that we can be in relationship with you today. the silence, the roaring lion declares that the grave has no claim on me. The grave has no claim on you if you are in Christ. And today we get to celebrate that reality that we have as Christians uh, through communion. Um, and so if you uh, are prepared to take communion, great, we're going to do that. If you're not, just press pause on whatever platform you're on and you can go get that now. Uh, Jesus referred to himself as the bread of life meaning it, it's Jesus who nourishes our soul. Uh, in Jesus, we, we find life. It's Jesus and in Jesus alone who satisfies us forever. Everything else that satisfies is only for a moment. It's only temporary, but it's Jesus who satisfies us forever. And so as we take communion together, uh, we remember, we declare that it's Jesus and Jesus alone who provides all that we need, and he did that on the cross. So if you are a Christian, if you have put your faith in Jesus, I'm gonna invite you to um, join me as we do this tradition that Jesus himself started. And this is what he said. Uh, 
in 1 Corinthians, verse 24. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, referring to the bread as a symbol. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we, we use a symbol, bread or crack or whatever you have, it's just a symbol. But what it means is so much more. It means that we believe upon Jesus and what he did on the cross is enough for us to be free and forgiven of our sin so that we can have a relationship with Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your broken body. Lord, as we remember what you did, it's not lost on us how amazing this is and how we did nothing to deserve it, but you are just so graceful. Thank you, Lord. Let's take it together. dinner. Jesus is with his friends, his followers, and he takes a cup and he says this, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So the cup, again, is just a symbol. So it doesn't really matter what liquid you have. Well, maybe it does. Be be wise. (laughs) But what it symbolizes is Jesus' shed blood for you and for me. Jesus, we thank you for your shed blood. Lord, we know that um, it cost you everything so that we could have life with you. And so, Lord, we remember you. We remember what you did, and we proclaim your death until you return. Let's take together. Thank you, Jesus, for our church family gathered all scattered throughout the cities and their homes and beyond. Lord, today we remember you. As one, we remember what you did for us. That, that we all come to you in this humble position, needing your forgiveness, needing your grace, and needing a miracle that comes through the cross, salvation. Lord, you gave that to us, and so we are forever grateful and thankful. Lord, we continue to worship you today.
God, we're so thankful that no matter what we're walking through, whether it's the best time in our life or the worst time, God, you're so close. You're right by our side. And Jesus, I just pray as we hear your word today, that our hearts would be so open and impacted to hear what it is you wanna say to us. That we be just moved by your spirit, Lord, and encouraged. I pray that you would bless each and every person watching right now, Lord, wherever they're at. In your name, Lord Jesus, amen. Thanks for joining us. I'm starting a series for the month of February entitled Truly Madly Deeply, and it's a series on relationships, more specifically a series targeted on how to make marriage work. You know, over the past year, I've talked with many couples who have experienced some sort of marital tension or breakdown. I've seen and heard of marriages that have ended up in the ER, and some are not sure they can be resuscitated. You know, in a recent article on a global news uh, website, a divorce lawyer in Toronto indicated that call volumes since COVID began are up 20%. In fact, it's likely that Canada will pass its 38% divorce rate because of the implications of COVID. And as your pastor, this weighs heavy on me because it's not just out there, it's all of us as well. So this is something I just really felt I needed to speak to. You know, 22 years ago, when Marla and I were planning our wedding ceremony, we were debating about some songs that we were going to have sung in that ceremony. And a contender was the title to this series, Truly, Madly, Deeply. Listen to what these words of this song say. I'll be your dream. I'll be your wish. I'll be your fantasy. I'll be your hope. I'll be your love. Be everything that you need. I love you more with every breath. Truly, madly, deeply do. I will be strong. I will be faithful because I'm counting on a new beginning, a reason for living, and a deeper meaning. And I'm like, wow, this dude, he was in love. And he's making some big promises. Maybe you know the song. He's saying, I'm going to be everything for you. I will make your life the best it can be. And he's believing someone else will do the same for him. He's putting all hopes in this relationship to change everything. We all want something like that. We all want to be on the receiving end of promises like that. We all want to be old walking hand in hand with someone. But it doesn't just happen. And so this series is for those who one day want to get married, for those who find themselves in a great marriage, for those struggling in marriage, and for those who might find themselves on the other side of a marriage breakdown. In fact, it's even for those who would say, I don't ever want to be married because a series on how to make marriage work coincides with how to make relationships work. There isn't a single relationship where at some point we don't experience tension. And this is just my personal belief. I, I think tension is caused because of one thing, and it's with friends, it's with coworkers, it's with family, and specifically our spouses. And that one thing is this, expectations. Like, what causes us to get frustrated with someone else? What provokes us to anger with someone else? What brings friction between us and someone else? It's unmet expectations. We expected one thing, and it didn't happen. 
We expected a response, and it never came. We expected the future to be one way, and it didn't pan out that way. And when expectations get shattered, broken, or even just casually pushed aside, we're filled with scenarios that cause tension and breakdown. You know, whenever I meet with a married couple and they admit that things between them aren't going well, I actually ask a simple question. Do you know each other's top three expectations for the relationship? And most of the time, I would say they can't really articulate it. Uh, A couple of reasons. Sometimes they just come guns loaded, ready to blow up about their spouse. And sometimes the truth is they just don't honestly know because they've only been thinking about their own expectations. So I kind of give them an assignment, and that is have the conversation. Know your spouse's top three expectations. Because my hunch is most of the tension can be solved tracing back to these. And here's what I mean. If they're angry about something, if they're frustrated about something, think through the expectations, and if you can identify one that hasn't been talked about, met, or looked after for some time, you might be onto something. And, and even if you're watching now, like if you're married, if you're feeling like something's adrift in your marriage, or even if your marriage is good, I want to encourage you to have the expectations conversation. It's super helpful. But there are times, however, that bigger and even more debilitating issues surface in a marriage, and we need to work through them. So what do we do then? I would say marriages struggle because so often people are not spiritually prepared to live in a marriage that honors God. And just so you know, a God-honoring marriage is completely and totally possible. That's part of the goal of this series. When you say I do to someone, you promise a lot of things, and sometimes we get those promises mixed up. And so for the month ahead, I'm going to be teaching us and helping us to see lasting promises that make marriage last. I'm going to be looking at four promises you need to make beyond the promise of I do. And my thoughts, they come from reading books, from listening to some podcasts, from some material from Craig Rochelle, and also just from my experience of pastoring for 24 years and being married for almost 22. You know, Disney and Hollywood have pretty much convinced us that in order to be really fulfilled, you need to meet your one. That's when you're going to be really happy. That's when your life will have meaning. And you'll know it because that person, oh man, they just give you goosebumps. Every song on the radio suddenly makes sense and you want to buy them every card at Hallmark. And today, what I'm hoping for is that you're not going to be saying I've met the one, but I've met my two. Because in any marriage, God needs to be your first pursuit and your spouse needs to be your second. Jesus said this when asked, what's the most important thing in life? He said it this way, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. God first, then others. I've heard this a lot if you've been in church for any amount of time. And to have a really good marriage, we need to say, I will pursue God first and my spouse second. I will pursue God first and my spouse second. And just for a moment, I want to talk to those who aren't married and one day want to be married. If there's a promise that I could give you to make, it would be around this principle, okay? Seek God first while preparing for your second. Commit to putting God in his right place in order for someone else to establish the right place in your life. And what this does is you become the person you want to marry. In other words, you attract who you are. And so as a Christian, you want, in fact, I would say you need someone who loves the Lord and wants to put him first. So do that in your own life now, not two years from now. Live for God now. Be devoted to him wholeheartedly now. Make him priority in your life now. Seek him first as you prepare for your second. And for those who are married, here's a promise you need to make and implement. 
I will pursue God first and my spouse second. That was God's intention. I want to take you back to Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and uh, l- read these words to you. It says this, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother, and this reason being that there was no suitable helper found for Adam, the first man that was created, and so God created a suitable helper for him, a woman named Eve. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Now that's strong language. Jesus echoed the same thing. He said it this way. Have you not read that from the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, notice the exact same language, right? For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. One flesh, meaning inseparable, together forever. It's both a physical and a spiritual concept. And since it's ordained by God in this way, we need to make sure we are connected with the one who makes the connection. God is your first pursuit and your spouse is your second. The problem comes when we flip that around. What happens then is we begin to idolize someone to the point of unhealthiness, and then one day we actually demonize them. It's just what we do. We idolize someone, then we demonize them. That woman, she's everything I've ever wanted. She's perfect. She's amazing. She's all that. And then one day, she's not all that. She's too picky. She's annoyed at everything. We idolize, then demonize. Ladies, you're like, oh, this guy is so laid back. He's so relaxed. And then you get married and suddenly he's lazy. He won't mow the yard. He won't do anything. We idolize, then demonize. It's this pattern of thinking that is couples landing themselves in common law relationships, living together before committing together, and then finding themselves frustrated with the relationship. We have idolized someone to the point of making them the be-all and end-all, and then something goes off, and we immediately demonize them. And here's the problem with this. You are asking your spouse or, or significant other to meet a need that they were not designed to meet. God is the only one who can meet your need of priority, not your spouse. That's why this pursuit matters. I will pursue God first and my spouse second. And here's what happens when you do this. It has an amazing effect on marriage. Now, John, he was one of Jesus' closest friends. He was a disciple, and he said it this way. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in him. Great words there. Um, God is love. You've heard that probably at some point before. That was illustrated by what Jesus did for every single one of us uh, as he went to the cross, and we remembered that through communion this morning, where, where Jesus gave his life for ours so that we can have forgiveness of sins and a new start, a reset, where Jesus actually came and reset all that was wrong with humanity and made it right. That's the greatest act of love. There's no question. So as we pursue God... We are then pursuing love because God is love. We are learning how to love. And what is love? Paul describes it this way. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And if you were to take every single one of those attributes about love, they are the things that make any and every relationship work. They are the things that increase enjoyment and fulfillment in any and every relationship. They are the things needed in making a marriage one that will last. I mean, check it out, okay? So, patience. We all need patience with our spouses. Kindness. It's really good to be kind in a relationship. And then we read things like, love does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. Every marriage breakdown is because one of these things has gone off track and someone has decided to take their first pursuit off the table. 
Friend, pursue God first. Pursue love. And and what you will get is an ever-increasing measure of these qualities in your life. You know, when I met Marla, I honestly started off with the wrong perspective. I was seeking what was best for me and my future, so much so that we actually had to break up during our dating lives for almost a year. But it was in that year where God challenged both of us with pursuing him first and what was best for his future for our lives. Pursue God first. It changes everything. And in that process, something very important starts to happen. Something needed in marriage and in fact in every relationship. As you pursue God, you begin to guard your heart. Pursuing God acts as the shield to the things that we face in marriage. And those attributes that we just read about love, those attributes are needed because of the tension that will be experienced when you are in love and those tensions always attack our heart. And you mess this up and very quickly you become more and more self-centered. And when that happens, things like irritability and annoyance surface. And people can get annoyed about the most ridiculous things. I'm serious. I was chatting with one married couple where one of them said that their spouse's laugh annoyed them. I've talked to others and the way someone eats annoys them. That's a bad road to be on, man. And here's some advice. You can't change that. Accept it. Live with it and move on. Whenever you put your spouse before God, whenever you mess up that order, you will get frustrated quicker. You will be self-centered over God-centered. You'll say things like, oh, they never do what I want them to do. And by the way, that word never is so ridiculous. It becomes about them meeting your needs and what you want out of this marriage. I will pursue God first, And my spouse, second. You know, we could actually mess up this order when kids come along as well. Suddenly, instead of the marriage relationship being the second priority under God, kids become the priority. And then sometimes one of the individuals, and it's usually the husband, may get a little bit jealous or jaded. And instead of pouring himself into the marriage, he pours himself into work and she pours himself or herself into the kids. And suddenly, the marriage relationship gets put on the shelf. And I've seen this happen. Kids leave the house, and the couple is facing each other going, Who are you? What do we do now? Like, we don't even know how to have fun together anymore. You don't have any intimacy because your whole life has revolved around the kids. Don't be child-centered in your marriage. Children are important. There's no question. They're a gift from God. But I want you to love your kids. And in doing so, you need to prioritize your marriage. That's one of the best ways you can be a blessing to your kids. Don't drift apart. And think about it this way. Children are a temporary assignment. We will have them for maybe 18 or 21 years, uh, unless, of course, if they're a millennial, then maybe for like 30 years. And yes, I love you millennials, but at some point they go out on their own and we release them to follow the Lord and what he has for them. That's a temporary assignment. Your marriage is till death do us part. It's not until we're not happy anymore. It's not until something better comes along or until you can trade it in for a different model or until the kids are gone. Your marriage is a permanent God-honoring commitment, and that's why we have to continue to prioritize it even above the kids. I've heard it said that if you want your kids to succeed in marriage, show them what a God-honoring marriage looks like. And maybe, maybe you're watching and you messed up. Don't allow a mistake or a tragic wreck to hinder what your future can look like. Move forward and say, this time I'm going to illustrate what a God-centered marriage looks like. In fact, by doing this, you also illustrate another thing. You illustrate grace and forgiveness because we all make mistakes. And the key is asking for forgiveness and moving forward and wanting to be different, to never do that again. 
The Bible actually has a word for that. The Bible calls it repentance, turning 180 degrees from what you were doing to pursuing another way, a different way, a better way. And maybe today you need to repent. Repent for the things that you have done in your marriage, for the things you are doing in your marriage, for the past that follows you around, which is hindering your relationships and even potentially your future marriage, for recognizing you're living like you are married, but you haven't made that commitment. Whatever is there, take the time to repent. Come to the Lord. And here's the good news. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Confession leads to transformation. It leads to a new way of life, a new way of doing relationships, a new way of doing marriage. And confession needs to follow the same pattern as the right pursuit in your marriage. Confess to God first and then secondly, confess to your spouse. And if you live this way, you will create a secure foundation in your marriage that when the storms come, when the arguments ensue, when the tension increases, it won't break. You've built your house upon the rock, upon Christ, and this house is going to stand. Because it's not always the bad things that can ruin a marriage. Like kids, it can be something good that is not in the right priority. It could be, you know, maybe your spouse spends more time with others than with you. It can be an all-consuming focus on a job. It could even be your spouse's phone, good old phones, right? Uh, They sit next to us in our bedroom. They're distracting. They're intriguing. Here's a great strategy with the phone, by the way, and that is never bring it into your bedroom at night. Leave it out. You see, it's not always the bad things that can ruin a relationship or destroy a marriage. It's often the good things that are out of place. So here's something I want to challenge you with. Protect the priorities. Protect the priorities. When you protect something, you shield it. You make sure nothing can hurt it. You put all your effort into keeping it the way it needs to be kept because of the value it brings. Protect the priorities. And for a moment here, I just want to talk to the guys because I can relate a little bit more here. But let me charge you as a man to take responsibility to protect the priorities because that's who you are. You're protectors. Think about it. If someone breaks into your house and attempts to attack your family, you're going to fight back. You might have, uh, I don't know, a baseball bat by the bed. You might have some nunchucks. Some guys I know have weapons all over the house with the sole intention that they will take out whoever tries to take them out. You mess with my family, man, you're going to have to mess with me. And here's what's interesting. Guys, you are charged by God to do this. Listen to what Paul wrote in Ephesians 5.25. He says, husbands... Love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Here's the call. Love your wives. Serve them. Honor them, just as Christ loved the church and did what? He gave himself up for the church. Protect the priorities at all costs. Now, for anyone watching, whether you are married want to be married, divorced, hoping to be married again, realize this is key to making a marriage work. This is one of those lasting promises. Protect the priorities. I will pursue God first and my spouse second. And if your marriage is struggling in any way, I can almost guarantee you can trace it to this root issue. You're not putting God first. Together, you're not seeking God. And so if you want your marriage to grow, serve God together. Get connected in church. Seek him first every day. Pray together. Center your marriage around God's word. Seek Jesus together. Pursue God first and your spouse second. Jesus said it this way, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. All these things being everything else we want out of life. He's reminding us of the order that brings order. And here's what you got to understand. To keep God first as a couple, 
You need to keep God first as an individual. Faith in Jesus has to be authentic and real in your own life because you can't prioritize God through your spouse. So friend, know God personally. Know him as your Lord and Savior. Know him as your friend and confidant. Know God from the depths of your heart. That will build the godly foundation in your marriage. You know, think about, think about your deathbed. And as a pastor, I've, I've been with people as they are facing the last moments of their life. And let me tell you, it's in those moments only two things matter. God and family. I mean, some people don't believe in God their whole life, but in that moment they ponder, is there a God and where do I stand? But then the next thing everyone wants is their family. It's God and family that matters most. So why not do this way before you reach that point? Make this promise. I will pursue God first and my spouse second. And I recognize that there are so many hurting relationships right now and know this. I hurt with you. My heart breaks as I think about the tension and the pain that some of you are living in. And what I'm talking about today is simple, but it's not easy. The simple is say, okay, God, will you be my first pursuit? And I'm going to try and make my spouse my second. The difficult part is actually putting it into practice. And this is where you just need to say, I do. I will commit to this. I will seek God first. I will get on my knees and get to know him. I will desire to have his work in my life, and then I will look to my spouse and seek after them. And I completely believe that you can never be fully fulfilled in life unless you know the Lord, unless you make him your first pursuit, because following Jesus is the best decision you can make. Remember how... At the beginning, I mentioned that Marla and I were debating about this song entitled Truly Madly Deeply for our wedding ceremony, the one with all those promises being made. We decided on another song, and we actually included worship in our ceremony as well. Remember the song, maybe you do, maybe you don't, Shout to the Lord? Well, that was in our ceremony. And, and the reason was we wanted to put God first and hope that would be exemplified right from the start of our lives together. Friend, you want to make a lasting promise that will make your marriage last? Here's the promise for this week. I promise to pursue God first and my spouse second. I will protect this priority at all costs. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you that we can find such practical help and advice through the words and the word that you've given us. And I thank you for every person that's tuned in today. And I just want to pray first and foremost for those who are hurt and struggling inside of their marriages and relationships. I pray that you just give them an extra measure of grace today. I pray that you help them reprioritize their life around that which matters most. May they find healing in you, Lord. May they find next in you, Lord. May they find restoration in you, Lord. And so I just pray over marriages that are just facing a little bit of tension or a lot of tension today. May this day, may they reach out to you and say, God, I'm going to pursue you first and a allow you to make a difference inside of them. I think about those who are not married and tuning in. God, I pray that they will seek you above all as they prepare for their next, as they prepare for their second. God, I ask that you just help them in their day-to-day. -day. Maybe some of them have been longing for this relationship in life, saying, God, where is it? I pray that they may just press into you, that they may know you greater and deeper and more, and they just prep themselves for whoever it is that you may bring into their life, and so move and work inside of them. And I want to pray for those who are married, no matter where they find themselves, with God's help, will they make their uh, first pursuit you and their spouse their second? 
Oh God, I pray that in every marriage, conversations will take place, maybe today or in the days ahead, and, and may their marriages be full of grace. May their marriages be productive so that people find ways to improve their marriage. May you bring healing and intimacy and restoration and health. I pray, God, that as we move forward, we may prioritize you in our lives and you in our marriages and you in our home because that makes all the difference. And so today we make that promise to you. I will pursue God first and my spouse second. You know, and maybe, maybe you're watching and you're saying, yeah, I want to make God first in my life. I haven't intentionally made that choice. I haven't intentionally said that this is what I want to do. Maybe you want to commit your life to Christ. Maybe you're saying, in my life, everything else is first except God. And today, I want to make him Lord and leader. Today, I want to pursue him first. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to ask you to pray along with me. Jesus, I just ask that whoever is resonating with these words, may they, in their heart of hearts, and in their mind, just say, I want to make you first. And so that means inviting you into my life. I thank you for going to the cross. I thank you for dying for the forgiveness of my sins. I thank you for rising again for hope and a reset. And today I say, help me to make you Lord and leader of my life. Leader being number one. Leader being you that I pursue above all else. And so I commit myself fully and completely to you. And I want to follow after your ways. And so God, I pray for individuals, for couples, and for families that have tuned in. Bless them today. Speak to them today. And may every single one of us, no matter where we find ourselves on the spectrum with relationships, may we say, I want to pursue God first in my life. And may we pursue relationships second. And so I just pray that blessing upon every home in your name. Amen. Maybe you prayed that prayer of, surrendering your life to Christ or just saying, God, I want to put you first in my life. And if that's you and you really want to do this, can I ask you to go to hopecity.ca slash life. It's a landing page we have there and there's multiple things you can engage with. We have a booklet that talks a little bit more about knowing and following Jesus. You can download it there. Uh, we'd love to connect with you as a church and you can reach out and one of our pastors will be in touch with you there. And it also introduces you to the Alpha Course. And we just really believe that if you're new to faith, this is a great course to uh, explore God and have your questions answered about who God is and how do you live in a relationship with him. So I, I just encourage you to check that page out. Now next week, I'm going to be continuing on in this series talking about what it actually means to pursue your spouse. And it fits good because next Sunday is Valentine's Day. And yes, you're welcome for that reminder. Um, if you're a football fan, today is also a big day for you. Tampa Bay and Kansas City, here we go. Anyways, God bless you guys. Thanks for tuning in, praying for you, and cheering you on. See you next week. Before you go, we wanted to let you know that there are some great next steps if you're looking to invest in your marriage and or pursuit of healthy relationships. For example, we have this free five week together for good online marriage workshop that's coming up starting February 17th. The workshop consists of five sessions that give couples tools, exercises, and guided conversations to grow a healthier and more joy-filled, resilient marriage. Now, each session will help you move past differences and intentionally grow into greater closeness and trust. Couples learn how to strengthen the foundation of their relationship in areas like communication, conflict, sex, and spirituality. You can go to hopecity.ca slash marriage to get more info and also to register. But that's not all you're going to find there. See, you're also going to find other resources like Bible studies, small groups, and other great ideas and opportunities as you pursue godliness in the area of your relationships and your marriage. Every week between our services, website, and social media, I don't know if you know this, but we reach thousands of people with the good news of Jesus digitally. Our aim every week and in every way is to connect you with Jesus, with each other, and with us. For those of you who not only give your time and talents, but also faithfully and generously partner with us financially, thank you. We couldn't do without you, and we wouldn't want to do it without you. If you've got questions about giving or how you can start to give, go to hopecity.ca slash give. We love you, Hope City, and are praying for you. Whether this is your first time engaging or we happen to be your church, we're glad you engaged today. We're praying for you, and we'll see you next week.